Judge, I want to begin by calling your attention to the defendant's interview um, at the Crystal Lake Police Department on the morning of AJ's phony disappearance. Neither frantic nor hysterical, she sits waiting to be interviewed. And as she's sitting there, sort of looking around the room, getting acquainted with her, her getting acquainted with her surroundings, if you look closely, she looks right at the video camera in the room recording her. Immediately, she begins to recite the Our Father, ending with her own improvised prayer for AJ's safe return. Two days earlier, knowing the jail is recording the conversation that she's having with her incarcerated, drug-addicted boyfriend, she asks AJ, who at this point, whose dead and swollen body is wedged into a tote in the basement, she asks him to go and get her a Red Bull in a diabolical effort to throw off a police investigation that she knew was coming. Such is the depths of her depravity and deceit. Anything to keep others from knowing who she is and what she had done. I mean, my gosh, she had done these things knowing that a few days earlier she had beaten this little boy to the brink and then literally locked him in his room where he had to endure the bleak process of death all by himself. A process that was detailed to us by Dr. Wittick, which entailed AJ's head and his brain beginning to swell from the innumerable number of blows that he had received. His brain getting too big for the skull that it was encased in, pushing up against the side of it, cutting off breathing. And as he struggled to breathe, as he choked, and he gasped for air, the generous amount of blood in his mouth was being sucked into his lungs, leaving imprints called leopard spots. At some point that evening, in the blackness of the room, the pain and the trauma to AJ's little body proved too much. And mercifully, he died. He died. Five years old, locked in a room, cold, wet, brutalized from top to bottom, and totally and profoundly alone. The first factor in mitigation that I'd ask you to consider, Judge, is subsection 735.5-5-3.1 backslash 2A1, whether or not the defendant's conduct caused harm. And when we think about the harm, when we think about the injury to AJ, it goes well beyond the uh, brutality that he endured on April 14th of 2019. He lived his life in the shadow of her darkness, a dystopian world where your mother hates you, scapegoats you, beats you for minor infractions, locks you in your room so that your childish exuberance doesn't get in the way of her benzo, amphetamine, and opioid abuse. A confusing and baffling world your little body, which is not yet potty trained, can betray you and hand you over for more beatings. And when you don't have the words to defend yourself against your tormentor. A terrifying world where you're alone and you're entirely defenseless. And you know it because mother has explained to you in no uncertain terms, no way out, nowhere to run, Nobody that can help you. AJ's clipped life after our social service agencies determined that this horror of a human being was a passable mother, and all that that word is supposed to mean was nothing other than a long and a painful betrayal. But the real harm, the real injury caused by AJ's death, like the importance and the dignity of all human beings, is limitless. It's infinite. AJ is irreplaceable. Nothing we can do can bring him back. Nothing that we can give can get him back. But we're talking here, Judge, about a five-year-old child. As you saw in the video, this sweet, cheerful, affable little boy and all of his promise and all that was possible. This wasn't a quiet, peaceful death in his bed, surrounded by his loved ones, this was a scourging, blow after unrelenting blow after unrelenting blow after
after unrelenting blow, after unrelenting blow, all while being buffeted with freezing cold water, all with his mother howling and screaming in his face. And don't forget, all of this agony, all of this pain, all had to be endured by the mind and the psyche of a child and all of the added sensitivities and vulnerabilities that come with that. And the last thing I want to touch on, Judge, is just the harm to the community. And I think it's fair to talk about because she enlisted their help in finding her dead son. And this goes beyond the incredible resources that the Crystal Lake Police Department and the FBI had to expend getting to the bottom of the defendant's sick charade. We're decent people in McHenry County who have an instinctive bone marrow deep stake in the welfare of children in this community. And after the unspeakable truth about what she did to AJ came to light, I would describe the mood in this community as one of despair. And I think it still lingers today. Touching on some of the factors in mitigation, question is under 735-5-5-3.1A1, whether or not there are substantial grounds tending to excuse or to justify the defendant's criminal conduct. We also need to consider section 5-5-3.1A8, whether or not the defendant's criminal conduct was a result of circumstances likely to reoccur. And when we think about whether or not the defendant should be excused for her conduct or whether or not these are circumstances that are likely to reoccur, we really need to ask ourselves, well, who is this person that's sitting before us? And when we do that, I think we should ask ourselves, well, how was it exactly that she was able to get away with the sickening abuse and imprisonment of AJ for so long? And I'll tell you why. Because she is extraordinary at playing her public persona. The unassuming, sheepish, religiously devoted, long-suffering victim, as we saw with all of those tears during the interview, as we saw with all of those tears at the candlelight vigil, as we saw with the Red Bull stunt, as we saw with the stunt where she's texting her defense attorney about not being able to find AJ, how he's playing hide and seek. I mean, did you see her pre-sentence investigation? Just this long tale of woes, where she's just this object being acted upon, and nothing is ever her fault. A tale in which AJ is hardly even mentioned, except to insult him. No remorse, no regret is expressed. And she still will not let us write the final chapter of AJ's life by coming clean on what she ultimately did to him. Oh, a judge, she was abused as a child by her mother and her stepmother. Allegations that are denied. Oh, but judge, apparently she's been the victim of domestic abuse in every single relationship that she's ever had. Allegations that are also denied. She's the one that got arrested in 2013 for domestic battery. She's the one in 2012, a divorce court made the finding that she's guilty of repeated acts of physical violence. Oh, but judge, her personality changed in December of 2017 because of the Adderall. She's been abusing Adderall since 2012. And this rage is not directed at anybody else but AJ. Oh, but judge, she started using heroin in 2012 when she was put in jail as part of the divorce proceedings. And though she was pregnant with AJ, though his life and his health should have been preeminent, she starts using heroin and she continues to use throughout her pregnancy, such that she gets AJ taken away as a baby. Well, she gets him back as a little boy. Little boy getting in the way of benzo, amphetamine, and opioid abuse, lock him in his room. Little boy locked in his room, can't figure out how to potty train himself. Beat him. Tough little boy stands up to you, isn't just going to lay down for your tyranny. Beat him harder. Well, now we got little boy's dead body getting in the way of benzoamphetamine and opioid abuse and magical new life with drug addicted, face tattooed, incarcerated boyfriend. Put him in a tote, hide him in the basement, and then bury him in a shallow grave. I mean, my God. We can begin. Somebody can begin to try to understand this, but you got to do a couple things. The first thing that you need to do, Judge, is you need to completely suspend your humanity. Any sense of humanity, you just need to push it aside if you want to understand Joanne Cunningham. The second thing you need to do is you need to appropriately prioritize her self-love. You have to ask yourself, what's best for Joanne? And then watch, through the tears, through the pleading looks, 
through the soft-spoken voice as she tries to wriggle off her hook, if she tries to wriggle off the hook for her radical selfishness. She hasn't been sitting here crying for AJ. She's been sitting here crying for herself. What she did goes beyond any category of wrong or bad or very wrong or really bad. It cannot be understood by the clinical pathological language that Dr. Meyer wants to attribute to it. It's evil. It's evil. And trying to understand evil, showing tolerance in the face of this type of evil, only begets more evil. Judge, taking into account all of the evidence, if ever there was a case that demanded the most forceful and maximum response, not only based on the nature of the case, but their own expert witness saying that she's going to continue to be a danger for the rest of her life. It is this case. For the reason stated, and to deter other people from committing the same offense, we're asking for 60 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. Thank you for your attention, Judge. Thank you.